Well, good morning, North Bend Church. We're so glad that you are joining us today for our morning service. If, if you are happy that it is not 90 degrees at 9 a.m., go ahead and say amen. 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 That's the most vocal this church has ever been, I think. Hey, again, we're so glad that you're joining us this morning. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful day to be together and to, to give God glory and to praise Him together in one place. Uh, just the only announcement today is that tonight at, at 6 o'clock, we do have North Bend students every Sunday night up at the center. So if you have students in the grades 7th through 12th grade, we would love to have them up there every Sunday night. So in just a few moments, the band behind me is going to lead us into worship today, and then Pastor Jason will be here with this morning's message. And at the end of service, as you're leaving, there's a couple of baskets where you can drop off a gift if you should so choose. Just want to thank you all for being so generous through this time. It allows us to do and continue to do uh, what the church is meant to do. So go ahead and stand your feet, and let's begin to worship. Faithfulness 
Jesus. And I will rest in your promise. My confidence is your faithfulness. And I will rest in your promise. You 
come with one voice, sing this out. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. Father, today we thank you so much for you are good and for you are here in this space today. God, you're great. We gather here today for you, for your glory, for your honor, through devotion to you, Lord God. I pray today, Lord, with all of my heart that you would be glorified, that you'd be magnified, that you'd be lifted high today in this space, Lord. May those driving by, God, see the devotion of your people, God, and may they be stirred to know who you are. I pray, God, for every single person here today, God, that they be lifted up, Lord God, as we focus on you, God. You be the lifter of our heads. Bring encouragement, bring joy, bring hope, bring peace, bring love, bring strength into the body of Christ today. We give you all praise, 
honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give God some praise today. You may be seated. Well, last week we, uh, we started looking through, teaching through, preaching through the book of James. And uh, we're going to be doing that for the next several weeks and just kind of working through this book because I believe there's something in it for us. The book of James at the very first line, he says that this is to the scattered church. As you look at that book, that letter to the early church, James was addressing it to the scattered church. And as we said last week, you know, the church seems a bit scattered right now. We're a little bit scattered out throughout this field. But all across America, all across this world, the church may seem a bit scattered. And so I felt like it was a good letter to dive into in this season. I want to point out a few things about the book of James today, and specifically about the early church and the scattered church at the time. We must understand as we read this letter and and all the letters really of the New Testament that there was little information for the early church. Little information for the early church. Information was limited. And I was talking this week to some people and I said, you know, as the early church received this book, the book of James, they actually all gathered together and sat and listened to the entire book. It was a letter written to God's people. So God's people came together and they listened to the whole entire book or letter of James. We must also understand that persecution, like real persecution was was very serious at this time in the church and things were very difficult. The ways of man and the tradition of man was pulling at the early church. The early church dealt with so many outside voices and outside traditions of man trying to pull away this new message of Jesus Christ. But James clearly teaches the church in his letter how to respond and how to live like Jesus. This letter is a response letter. James is encouraging the church, challenging the church to live like Jesus. Let's pray today. Father, thank you so much for your word. I pray today as we take it, we'd receive it, Lord God, as we hear it, we'd receive it. I pray today, God, that we would apply it to our life. I pray that as we hear the word of God, that we'd be challenged, we'd be encouraged, we'd be stirred up as the church to live for you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, have any of you ever had to go back and say that you were wrong about something? Anyone at all? I'm just curious. I, I need someone to help me out today. I, I, I don't know about you, but that is a difficult thing to do. It's a freeing thing to do, but when you have to go back and say, man, I was, I was wrong about that, or I didn't think clearly about that, sometimes that's a difficult thing and a difficult process, and sometimes that takes a while to get to that place. I want to say this morning that throughout the years, I, I've tended to have an attitude toward the idea of religion, toward the idea of religion. And maybe that even came across in some messages that I've, that I've preached and some things that I've taught over the years that you get this idea that, you know, as the church, we're not supposed to be about religion. And, you know, we coin phrases like this, that God desires relationship and not religion. And I want to say that that statement is partially true. That statement is partially true. God wants relationship, not religion. It's partially true. Let's be honest. It is easier for us to embrace the truth that we love and discard the truth that we have not yet fully understood. Amen to that. We embrace the truth that's easy for us. We embrace the truth that we love, that we connect with, and the truth that is more difficult for us to receive. It's easier for us to discard that truth. I think it would be wise to understand that God's Word does teach us about true religion, about pure religion. And true religion, pure religion, is evident by conduct. I want to say that again. True religion, pure religion is evident by conduct. And if I were to sum up, try to sum up anyway, the book of James, I would say this in one line, that he is telling us 
that our actions need to line up with our belief. Now, that's just my summary. There are some better ones out there, but today, for the sake of simplicity, I just want to say one line about the book of James in entirety. He's telling us, teaching us, urging us that our actions need to line up with our belief. I'm not so sure that James believed the statement that, well, it's all about what's in the heart. James is calling us into more of an action than he is, hey, just, just have the right intention. Intention is vitally important. Yes, God starts the work in our heart. But as he starts the work in our heart, he finishes it through our actions. So James was building upon what Jesus showed us on this earth. Last week we learned James was probably the oldest brother of Jesus. And so he heard his brother teach. He heard the Messiah teach. He heard the Lord teach. And now James is giving what he heard to the next generation of followers of Christ. James was building upon what Jesus showed us on this earth. And you're going to hear this statement a lot in, in, the, in these messages talking about kingdom culture. We talked about that some last week. Kingdom culture. James was expounding upon what kingdom culture looked like. This was a new culture. A new culture, the kingdom of God. And this new culture, it was certainly opposed to the ways of the world. That's why the early church came under so much persecution is because this was now an, another way. It was a third way, if you will, a new way of living, a new way of teaching, and it challenged the tradition of man. It challenged the tradition of religion. It challenged the heart of humanity. We're going to pick this up in James chapter 1, verse 19. James comes out here in verse 19, and he says this, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Amen and amen. I'm going to tell you the world would instantly get better if we would simply take note and do this right here. Amen? Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Some may be wondering today, what is the kingdom of God? What is kingdom culture? Well, this right here is just a little bit of kingdom culture. How can you define kingdom culture? Well, you define kingdom culture by characteristics, actions, and responses. Characteristics, actions, and responses. James is giving us some kingdom culture when he says this. Hey, church, be quick to listen. Hey, church, be slow to speak. Hey, church, be slow to become angry. I'm not sure about you, but this is not easy, right? This is not easy, and it's harder today than it was a year ago. Amen. Be slow to speak, quick to listen, slow to become angry. Kingdom culture is tied to our response. Did you hear this about kingdom culture? You know, Jesus talked about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. John the Baptist talked about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? Well, the kingdom of God has a culture to it. It has a king and it has a people, and those people respond differently than the kingdom of the world. If we are a part of the kingdom of God, our response, listen, our response is supposed to be different than the kingdom of the world. Kingdom living is tied to our response. So I want to really challenge someone today to weigh your words. Weigh your words. Have you ever weighed your words before? I don't know if you've ever done this, but, but I've like typed out responses before that were really long just to see what they looked like and then deleted them. Anybody ever done that? Like, whether that's, it'd be a, it's a great thing to start doing specifically on Facebook because, you know, it's so easy these days in our culture, in all forms of social media, it's so easy these days, text message as well, to just type something up out of an emotion and send it because we're not seeing the sender. Or we're not seeing the person that's receiving it. Are you with me? So we just do these things and we think, well, this is well thought out. No, no, no. I would encourage you, type it out. 
maybe in, in the notes app first if you got an iPhone and then just look at it for a while and look at it some more. And, and I'm just guessing that if you start to weigh your words that you'll probably put that in the trash can. We, we need to be a people who are quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. James gives us some of that kingdom culture. Listen, kingdom culture is not always the loudest, but it is consistent. It is not exaggerated, but it is effective. That's what you need to know about kingdom culture, kingdom living. It's not always the one and not always the thing that's yelling the loudest, but it is the most constant. It is the most stable. It is the most consistent voice. You know, I feel like our culture seems to be the opposite of what we're talking about. You feel me? Never listening, yelling quickly, and mad about everything. Isn't that true? What, whatever, whatever it is you're, you're thinking about, whatever it is, whatever topic you're, you're, you're thinking about, isn't that the way it is? People are quick to yell, they never listen, and they get mad about everything. Come on now. You do live in this world, right? The Bible says we're, we live in this world, we're not of this world. So we see how the world responds. And sometimes, if we're not careful, we get pulled into the response of the world. Sometimes we get pulled into the fight that's not our fight. Our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and forces of darkness. That's what the Word of God teaches us. So we need to think differently about the fight that we engage in. Are you with me? This week, my daughter, she's 13, she said, Dad, we were taking this little walk at the, at the driveway, and she said, do people just find something or everything to get mad about? Did they, or did they just find something to get mad about, no matter what it is? I said, you're a smart girl. The answer is yes. It doesn't matter what the topic, it doesn't matter what the thing is, there's always someone who's mad about something. Always someone who's yelling about something. Have you ever found that in society that you, maybe you're just going about your everyday life and you just catch wind of someone just going off about something that seems so petty? Anybody at all? Maybe that's you. Maybe you don't have to look to the right or the left. Maybe it's you. Who knows? I just know that all of us can be guilty of that sometimes. But as the kingdom of God, we must learn to respond differently. Why? James tells us why. In verse 20, he says, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Think of that. Our anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Please hear this. God's word does not just give us do's and don'ts, but it does give us do's and don'ts. Are you hearing that? Maybe you've never heard me say that before. It doesn't just give us do's and don'ts, but it does give us do's and don'ts. But it also gives us reasoning for our responses. Are you hearing me? Reasoning for our responses. There is a reason why God desires us to respond a different way. He doesn't want us to be quick to speak, not listening, and mad about everything. Why? Because it does not produce his righteousness on the earth. And as Christ followers, being Christian is to be Christ-like. Christ-like. So the boundaries that he sets in place is to give him honor and glory, but also for the good of humanity. God does have a desire for our life. I just want to, let you, I want to let you know that today. God does have a desire for your life. God does desire specific responses from you. I know we live in a time right now when we would like to think that God just wants you to be happy. That's maybe one of the worst theological things we could ever believe, that God just wants you happy. I just want to tell the truth today. If you hear that, just, just take a step back and ask yourself, where do we find that in the Word of God? Because if God wants us to be something, He'll tell us in His Word. I know this is an exciting preaching, but I do believe it's truth-filled. If God wants us to know something, it will be in His Word. So 
So many times what we do is we say things that sound like God, but it's not God at all to make us feel better about ourselves and our current situation. Well, God would want me to do this because God just wants me happy. That is bad theology. That's bad doctrine because it sets up a life where everything revolves around what? Not around God, around us. It, it sets our life up to say, whatever I want, however I feel, I'm just going to tell you right now, Jason Simpkins needs not to do what he feels. I'm just letting you know, I do not need to respond the way I want to respond 98% of the time. Because if I operate in the flesh, I'm going to say a lot of things I shouldn't say, do a lot of things I shouldn't do, and I'm going to come across as one who does not live for and in the kingdom of God, but one who looks and resembles a lot like the world. God has a desire for our lives. Therefore, James says, verse 21. Everybody still here today? Yeah. Amen if you're here. All right. Most of you. Therefore... Get rid of all moral filth and the evil that's, that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. That word starts out therefore. Again, reasoning and some handles for this. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and evil that is so prevalent. That word therefore, he's basically saying, okay, you want to live kingdom? Here's what you do. You want to live for and in the kingdom of God? Here's what you do. Get rid of all filth and evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you. James is letting the church know that there is evil. I, I'm just going to tell you right now, there is evil. Evil. There is evil in the earth. Are you with me? We need to understand this, that there is a God who is at work and there is an enemy the devil who is at work in the earth today. We can see it when we turn on news. We can see it when we hear highlights of humanity throughout our week. We can know that there is something going on in the earth and has been going on the earth since the beginning of time. There has been evil prevalent. I love that word. It's letting us know that it's everywhere. But please hear this as God's people. James is not teaching us to be afraid. He's teaching us to be aware. There's a huge difference between being afraid of something and being aware of something. I think it is good to be aware of things that are happening in and around us. I think it's good to be aware of things that are happening in the earth. But I will say... As Christ's followers, we should be pressing into how to be more aware of the kingdom of God than the kingdom of the world. Because if we want to make a difference in the kingdom of God, we can't have 90% information from the kingdom of the world and 10% from the kingdom of God. Let me tell you, it's hard to push that out. I know this isn't, it's just, I thought about making it more clever, you know, and just some, some things that sound good and, you want to tell me, keep going and preach and all these things. I, I get that. But I just want to tell you today that we must understand that to be a part of the kingdom of God, our response must be clear in this earth. Our response must be clear in this earth. And I want to challenge us, and I'm challenging myself today, to live in such a way where I'm more kingdom of, of God focused than I'm kingdom of the world focused. What am I filling myself with? What is my fuel? I'm going to tell you, if you're angry, your fuel is not from God. If you're mad all the time, if you're frustrated all the time, if you've got sleepless nights and you just wake up and you're just, you're just mad at the whole world right now, I'm telling you, you need to press into the kingdom of God more than the kingdom of this world. Get rid of it. Whatever you got to do. I don't know what that is for you. I'm not the Holy Spirit. I can't tell you what to do with your life. But I can certainly tell you that the Word of God teaches that whatever it is that is pulling you back into this cycle and back into the rhythms and routines and responses of the world, get rid of it. Let it go. Because he says the Word of God can save you. The Word implanted in you can save you. I want to let you know today that the Word of God can reveal the hidden things in your heart. 
the things that you can't explain, the things that you don't know what's going on. God's word, as you get into the word of God, it begins to reveal those things about you. You can only really know who you are if you are looking at yourself in and through God's word, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Amen. He created you, so he knows your purpose. He knows your plan. He knows the desires he has for you. But if you're too caught up in all the things around you and not caught up in his word, it can't be revealed. The word will weed out that which is worthless in your life. Listen, there are some worthless things in our life sometimes, some things that we pick up that we don't need. There have been many things in my life that I've looked at and I've said, this is worthless. I'm giving myself to something that is taking me further away from God. The word will weed that out. The word of God will restore and make us whole. I want to let you know today that Jesus doesn't just desire to save you. He desires to make you whole. He desires to take you on this process and this journey of healing and hope and life and victory. Not just to barely save you from the world. Not just to barely cleanse you and make you look a little bit different. He comes to make you a part of a new kingdom, a new culture, a new way. It's transforming. James goes on to say, verse 1, 22 through 25. I love this. Don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at their face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Any of you guys wake up like that this morning? Husbands and wives do not look at each other and say amen. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law and gives the law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in all they do. As you look into the word of God, you stare into the word of God and you allow it to see you and reveal things in you and you don't forget what it says and you do what it says, you will be blessed. Church, James is making a clear statement here about profession and practice. Profession and practice. Many would profess Christ, but do we practice Christ? Many would profess Christianity, do we practice Christianity? I think now more than ever, it's so vitally important to be a light in the midst of the world. You know, we we use this term blessed a lot. I just want to say I love the term blessed. It's, It's a great term. We use it a lot. In the church, how you doing? I'm blessed, and you may very well be. You know, I think as we look at our life and we look around at our life, I think all of us can find some things that we feel very blessed about. Amen. You feel blessed this morning. I mean, we're, if you're sitting here today, you're blessed. The, the fact that you're just sitting here, you're, you're well enough to be here, to sit in these chairs and to be in the midst of God's people, we're blessed today. But the word blessed and the word does come with more connotation to it than that. We must understand that kingdom blessed and worldly blessed look drastically different. Kingdom blessed and worldly blessed looks drastically different. It isn't the same. Blessed, being blessed, doesn't come by simply believing, but God's word teaches us by doing. So we're not just blessed because we believe we're blessed, but we're blessed because we do the things God says to do. I heard this statement I was reminded of it this week. I've heard it for a long time, and I I love the statement, the idea behind that in God's word, all truth is held in tension. I'm not going to get too caught up on that statement, but I'm going somewhere with this story. All truth is held in tension. And so let me just give, for example, that, you know, grace and truth, for instance. God is grace, God is truth, right? Amen? But God is not all truth, and some grace, or all grace, and some truth. God is all truth. God is all grace. Are you with me? If God is all grace, and you forget the truth, then things can get lopsided. If he's all truth, and he's not grace, things can get lopsided. So to kind of give an idea of this, what I'm talking about, maybe a visual. I'm a visual person. Any visual learners out there? Hopefully this helps you a little bit. 
So this week, I, I went to the store. I was supposed to bring, uh, go get some milk and a couple other essentials, and I essentially bought a tent. <laughs> Ladies, if, if you understand and you have a husband like that, that you tell him to get one thing and he comes back with something that is to, totally different than anything you asked for, that's me. My wife has learned to embrace it. She's so gracious at doing so. So I come home. I'm carrying this big old tent and milk. It's like, what did you do? I said, it said seven-person tent. We got a six-person family. We got room for one more. I thought, let's go. Let's see, it just makes sense. It, just, it was like calling to me. And it was one of those teepee tents. Like, we're not talking about like the new school, like domes with rooms and all this. No, we're talking old school teepee tent. And that nostalgia, it just called to me. Anybody feel what I'm talking about? I was like, I want to be an Indian tomorrow. Right? So I'm like, let's make this teepee tent. So anyway, the tent, it's, it's a very simple setup. It has literally two poles. Two poles, which terrified me, to be quite frank. I looked at it and I thought, there's no way that this whole tent, and it had like multiple sides to it, is going to be held up by these two poles. So, of course I didn't read the directions. Why the heck would I do that? And I just started doing things. Well, it got to the point where I'm like, okay, I'm still not reading directions. Let's go to YouTube. So, I went to YouTube. I watched like a 7 minute and 28 second video on this teepee tent thing. And I'm like, oh, okay, I get it. All the while teaching my son the ways of manhood. Don't ask questions, just set it up. So anyway, I put these two poles in there, and still the tent is just all jacked up, man. Like one side's draping, this side's, this side's kind of tight, this side's not. Well, they got these, these strings on each side, and there's like many strings. And then after further review and watching the video, I realized that all these strings had purpose. Obviously. Why is a string there? It has a purpose. So I put all the strings down, and I begin working these strings and tightening these strings. I forget what the strings are called. The YouTube video told me. I forgot, but I do know how to work them now. So I'm like pulling these strings down, and the tent's still all messed up. Is everybody still with me? Okay. And, and I begin to think about what we're talking about today and thinking this, that this tent represents so many things in God's Word, that there are strings that if they are all tightened and that there is the right tension on every string, then the tent will be perfectly erected. Are you with me? It'll stand up perfectly because the right tension is on all the strings. God's word, all of God's word is simply truth that is held in tension. And so when James is saying, don't just listen to the word of God, but do the word of God, what he's saying is there are two strings here that are vitally important. You must hear it, have faith for it, and then do it. Are you with me? And a lot of times in our life, if we're looking at our life like a tent, one side's all swayed in, the other one's super tight, it's getting ready to fall over. People's lives are all out of sorts, right? Like, there's not the right tension. Let's take grace and truth, for instance. You have some people that are all grace, 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 no truth, and their life's all about forgiveness and love and happiness and joy, but there's zero truth, and they're, they're very lopsided. Are you with me? They're usually always happy-go-lucky, nothing's ever wrong. Then you have truth people. They're always mad as heck. You know, said, do what God says or you're going to burn in hell. I'm telling you the Bible says that it's the truth of God's word. And so, so they're all angry, right? Amen? I was going to say, you know no angry people? No angry Christians? I know a few. So anyway, this tension over here is very tight and grace is lacking. In God's word, it's all truth held in tension. So he's saying, James is saying, listen, Receive the word, have faith for it, and also live by it. It is truth that is held in tension. There's two sides of the tent. Listen and do. Listen and do. In close, I want to look at James 1, verses 26 through 27. It says, Those who consider themselves religious... And yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues, deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted from the world. To keep oneself from being polluted from the world. Church, if we are not careful, our minds, our hearts, 
all of who we are can be polluted with the world. Focus on the kingdom of God. If you are a believer, let us not just simply hear the word of God. May we ask the Father, help us to do the word of God. Because we all know that's the difficult part. Help us not just to hear it, but to do it. The Bible says they deceive themselves. Those who consider themselves religious and don't keep a tight rein on their tongue, deceive themselves. Listen to what the word deceive means. To believe something that is not true, typically in order to gain personal advantage. Christians, let us not be deceived. Let us not believe things that are not true just because it brings a personal advantage to our life. That's good. James here is encouraging the church to talk the talk and to walk the walk. To do what we say we believe. Religious claims should be evident by our conduct. Now, I want to help someone today because maybe you're going to leave here today and say, you know what, I'm going to go and I'm going to be a loud Christian for the Lord. That's not what I'm telling you. That's not what I'm telling you. I'm not telling you to go get 15 bumper stickers and put them all over the back of your van. I actually refuse to do that because if I want to be a better Christian, I won't let anybody know who's driving that car. What I'm trying to say is this. Let us be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And daily asking God, God, how can we make your kingdom known today? And it may not be loud, but I'll tell you right now, it'll be consistent. And it may not be the most exaggerated thing out there, but I'll tell you this, it'll be the most effective thing out there. And God's people, the people of God, will permeate this earth and people will know there's something different about them. Let us not make our religion worthless by our responses. I don't know about you, but this whole message has caused me to simply pray, God, help me in my responses. Help me in what I receive and help me in how I respond to the world around me. Church, Jesus didn't just die to save us. He died to restore us to our original purpose, to love him and to love others, to serve God and to serve others and to be a light in the midst of this world. He died not just to save you, but to restore you to reclaim you, to rebuild you into who he really calls and created you to be. I don't know about you, but that's encouraging news for the church. Let's stand to our feet this morning. I simply want to pray today that the Holy Spirit of God would help us to respond like God's people. Has anybody been challenged and encouraged by the word of God today? I hope you have been. I believe it can do a great and mighty work not only in and through our life, but in and through our community, in and through our nation, in and through our world. Let's pray. Father, we, we love you. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your son Jesus that came to this earth, gave his life for us, lived for us, died for us, and rose again for us so that we could know what true life and victory is in you. I pray today, Lord God, for your church, for your people, for those who have been called by you, for those who have accepted your word, for those who have accepted what you did for them on the cross. I pray that you would strengthen them. I pray that you would encourage them. God, I pray that you would know that you have a specific design for each of us. But God, I believe also that all of us are called to do one thing, to bring honor and glory to you and to bring humanity to you, Lord. I pray that we would simply be ministers of reconciliation. And I believe how we do that, God, is by our response, by living like the kingdom of God. So I pray right now, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would fill each and every one today, God, with new hope, with new life, with new victory. God, may they forget yesterday, God, as they turn to you. Because we realize, Lord God, as we confess any sin to you, Lord God, confess any wrongdoing to you, Lord God, that we have been cleansed by your power by your grace, by your mercy.
May we not walk in shame. May we not walk in guilt. But may we walk in victory because of all that you've done for us, Lord Jesus. And I pray also for those who are here today who may not know you as Savior, who may not know you as Lord of their life, that right now in this moment, if they are drawn to you, God, they would simply say, Lord Jesus, I give my life to you. Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you. Cleanse me of my sin. Make me new. And may I walk in you. God, we love you. We praise you. We honor you. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, let's give God one last praise today. Thank you guys so much for coming out. You can fellowship a little bit as you leave. As of right now, service again here next week, if all goes well, 9 a.m. God bless you. We love you.